Good afternoon. We'll be starting our meeting shortly. Could you just confirm that you can hear me clearly? You can use the chat. Great. So it's uh, it's a pleasure to meet today with you um, here. This is the second webinar from the Ready Study Go Poland, and. Today we'll talk about uh, emotions under control, how to cope with your emotions, uh, what are typical reactions that you might be going through um, in this particular circumstances of the COVID-19 that we're all in right now. Uh, my name is Marta Borembiak and I am an assistant professor at the University of SWPS of Social Sciences and Humanities in Warsaw in Poland. I am also a certified psychotherapist and psychologist um, and uh, I run my private practice at ipsychologue.com and today I will talk to you about how to deal with your emotional states right now that you might be confronted with. Uh, so, let's start from uh, maybe some kind of a silly question, but is it possible to stop the F from spinning? And if I would ask you this question some time ago from today, maybe it would be still silly. However, today a lot of people have this kind of a feeling that a lot of things have changed a lot and in a way it's like the world that we used to know at least slowed down a bit from what it used to be. So you can imagine yourself, for example, at the end of uh, January 20 this year, and probably you were preparing yourself for more hard work, for more studies, uh, preparing for the final exams. Uh, some of you who are also trying to find some kind of balance between work and studying. Um, you are also engaged in a lot of activities, also taking care after your uh, close ones, your family, um, and maybe spending a lot of time uh, at the library, sleeping less, learning more. So I can imagine that the end of January is usually a very a very active time of the year for a lot of students. So thinking about yourself back then, if someone offered you this kind of miracle, this kind of opportunity to have like three weeks um, off um, and doing nothing and not uh, going to work, not attending any classes, having no everyday duties, um, like what would you think back then, what kind of proposition that would be for you. Well, probably at the end of January, when you are overloaded, lots of stuff happening in your everyday life, it might have been like a great proposal for a free vacation. So maybe a kind of opportunity to take. But how does it look to you right now when we are in the middle of this kind of specific situation. Uh, I assume that you are staying more or less three weeks at home so far. Well, this is the same for me and it's the same for a lot of uh, lecturers and a lot of people around the world. Uh, so you are out of your daily routine. Uh, you are not attending your classes at the university the way you used to, physically at least. You are not working, if you have been working before, so this is a big change. And most of all, you are not allowed to travel wherever you like and whenever you like, which includes also these very specific restrictions of not being able to come back home right now and to be with your family physically. So this kind of a dream opportunity that we may be thinking of a couple of months from now in the past, today it seems, well, for some people, like the beginning of the nightmare actually, because it's, it's not comfortable at all when you think about it. Plus, additionally, when you consider the reasons of why we all need to stay at home right now. So this is a situation of the COVID-19. So 
it is a situation of a real threat to your health and to your life. Um, this is also a threatful situation for a lot of people who are around you, which includes uh, basically every place in the world, every country, and every continent almost, and also people who are close to you there might be at risk of getting sick and also um, developing um, uh, some kind of health consequences, even being at risk of dying. It's also the fear of the fact that this situation medically is not fully understood yet. Uh, I used to work at Cancer Center Institute in Poland for eight years in the past. And I know that any situation that you are confronted with life-threatening conditions, like serious disease, it triggers a lot of emotions and it's inevitable to react emotionally. And right now in, we are in a situation of some kind of not fully known threat, medical threat. So no one is sure also when it's going to end, so how long this whole uh, pandemic situation is going to stay with us and what are going to be the consequences of that. So you may ask yourself, have the earth for real stop spinning then? Because sometimes I believe that it may feel as if it, it did. Because it is an extraordinary situation. When you think about the whole human modern history, this is the first time that the world slowed down for real. You observe it uh, in the area of traveling, markets, stocks, social life, um, uh, contact with other people, the fact that we change a lot of physical activities into online activities. It's never been like that before. So the situation is extraordinary. And what kind of experience you may have when all of this is happening around us. Well, usually people experience a lot of emotions, but it's somewhere between the anxiety and fear. And today when I'm having my uh, therapy sessions with my patients, all of them are online remotely because of the situation. Uh, the most common reaction, emotional reaction that I hear um, uh, about uh, from other people what they're dealing with is in fact a lot of anxiety and concerns that this situation brought on a lot of us. But how to understand what is the difference between fear and anxiety? Well, we psychologists, we love to define a lot of concepts and we love to define also different kinds of emotions. And fear is a concern of a real threat. So when you are in fear, it means that there is something that you are actually afraid of, but that is a um, probable cause of hurting you, of being dangerous to your life or to your health. This is a kind of evolutionary developed reaction because in the past it helped uh, the mankind to protect ourselves and to survive, basically. And today it's also helping you, me, a lot of us when we're in fear, to better protect ourselves and to survive under different circumstances. But the anxiety is something a bit different from that, even though sometimes it, it makes you feel in a similar way. So sometimes it's not easy to differentiate fears from anxiety. So I will tell, um, tell you um, in a couple of minutes how to differentiate those. Because anxieties are concerns about the threats that are unknown or imagined only. So there isn't any particular instant threat right now that would be some kind of a dangerous for your life or health. But it's more like the imagination of something bad that, that is going to happen. So in the situation when there is a real danger, all kind of anxiety adds pressure and burden to your emotional situation. Because it's a kind of reaction that when you take a look at it from the outside, if you were to observe yourself as you were an, some kind of observer looking at yourself from the corner of the room, that would look like you react in some kind of a way that is not matching the real level of danger. So it may look like irrational, 
too emotional or kind of inappropriate. So it doesn't help you to protect your life and health. In fact, it may make you feel even more confused, threatened and um, under pressure to act impulsively. It might be also overwhelming. So what actually uh, is happening, uh, you can also take a look at um, you know, some um, philosophers and uh, like Viktor Frankl, he was a psychotherapist, the founder of logotherapy. Um, he experienced um, uh, Holocaust and he said something very important that every kind of reaction is something that we are um, empowered with. So, as he said, an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. Which means that even if you think that you are in such concern, anxieties, fears, that you may, it may feel as if you are going crazy, well, the situation is kind of crazy itself. So, your reaction serves some kind of a purpose here. So, let's take a look what kind of the reaction might be. Typical disturbing thoughts that people have uh, these days around the situation that we are all in are, for example, like these. So, um, I will get sick. I will die from it. Uh, my family members will die from it. Uh, the virus, the coronavirus is so contagious that I better to use my balcony and I better stay in just one room just to make sure that I'm safe. So taking precautions that are actually out of proportion when you think about them. I will not survive being alone for so long. Kind of concern that a lot of people have, a lot of feelings of loneliness accompanies th these kind of thoughts. It will be never over. So the fantasy that the crisis uh, caused by coronavirus is going to last forever, that we're going to be isolated forever, things will not get back to normal, quite similar thoughts. I will have no money to survive, so I will die because of financial issues. I will have nothing to eat, no, no food, no shelter. It's an apocalypse. It's the end of the world. Um, and this, this set of thoughts that I just told you about, this is kind of a set of thoughts, well, maybe not all of them, but at least one, two, some of them, they come across the mind of many people right now who are trying to cope with the situation. On the other hand, you may have thoughts that seem quite similar to the previous ones, though when you take a closer look, they are a bit different. I can get sick. Some people die from it, so I may die from it. I'm at risk. It might be fatal to my older parents. It's quite contagious, so it's better to stay at home. I'm afraid that staying at home will make me feel lonely and miserable. A lot of people are afraid of that. I don't know when all of this will be over. No one knows when things get back to normal. I'm not, I'm afraid of my financial situation due to the fact that I'm not working at the moment. So when you take a look at the list on your right, it looks like, well, in a way it's all true, in the sense that there are some risks and some real threats in the situation we are currently dealing with. But, uh, it's not for sure that you will get sick and that you will die and all people around you will die because it's in the left column. What's the difference between those two sets of thoughts? Well, the, the difference is that the first ones are in fact anxieties and the second group, these are fears. So the anxieties concern scenarios that are not exactly matching the situation because it's not the situation that you will die while well, you are at risk as every one of us is but it's not for sure that you will die from it it's not the question of uh, if it's going to be over but rather when will it be over according to the information about the previous epidemic situation we have 
And it's not the apocalypse, it's not the end of the world. When you feel it as if it is the end of the world, it means that you are in anxiety. But if you have a fear that you may not have enough money to survive, that this is an extraordinary situation, well, yes, this is a threat that seems real and appropriate in this situation. So what to do with those emotional reactions that we develop, those anxieties and fears? how to cope with them. What to do with anxieties first, because they are definitely more burdening and uh, they are basically the reason why people feel a way more awful in the situation that they might be feeling without the anxieties. Well, anxieties are born from our imagination, they are born from our previous experiences, any kind of free associations we have between the situation we are currently in and the situations from the past. So what we can do actually, and this is the best way to deal with anxieties, is to test them against the reality. So do a kind of a work as if you were a researcher on your own anxieties. So you can ask yourself, for example, what kind of proof do I have to support this thought? What kind of facts do I have that actually tell me that I am going to die? Well, one day you are going to die, but no one can tell you that there is enough data to tell you that you are going to die right now because of the coronavirus. Is there any scientific data to support this? Is there any contrary proof? Well, feel free to research online, to go to our WHO website, Johns Hopkins University has a great data source that is being um, updated in real time. So you can get access to the data uh, as a researcher yourself. So you can test your anxiety and you can see basically if it is an anxiety or if it's a real concern, if it's a real fear. For example, when you have this kind of anxiety that it will never be over, what kind of contrary thoughts you can have what kind of proof to um, deal with this anxiety you can bring up. Well, basically when you read all kinds of interviews with epidemiologists, none of them would agree with the fact that it will never be over. Because every history of every epidemic, pandemic situation uh, that um, has been documented in the history, well, it ends one day. Uh, of course, in different ways and in different time, but it does. It, it never stays like that forever. So even if the coronavirus stays with us uh, as a pathogen uh, globally, still the situation will change. So the need for social isolation will change um, because the situation we are in right now and those restrictions are because we are in a very specific particular moment of the epidemic situation, we are actually at the beginning of it. So the more of us stays at home right now, the, the quicker we are going to move towards the phase when we will be all uh, living in a safe environment. So there will be an end to those restrictions, restrictions in traveling and so on. Um, and uh, the earliest, uh, well, the more, the most recent uh, epidemic situation uh, that probably you experienced was uh, the swine flu, approximately ten years ago. Uh, to share with you my personal experience, I got the swine flu myself. Um, but the pandemic, even though it was spread globally, actually we are not dealing with this at the moment. So it passed on its own. So we can also check the graph, so you can use the data, you can support yourself with science. Um, so remind yourself, for example, of the properties of the normal distribution that we have here on the picture. Well, it's not like the curve is raising up forever. This is the normal distribution, this is the Bell's distribution, so it means that we are in, in the time of the increase of the transmission of the virus, but then it's going to drop down gradually uh, the same way as it's increasing right now. So for sure, it's not going to last forever, even though you may feel as if it was going to be like that. So what to do with fears then? Well, with fears, it's kind of easier because 
I will not tell you to uh, keep working against them. I would even tell you do not fight them, kind of use them. Because every fear is like a direction for you personally, individually, for what is valuable in your life. So regarding those thoughts that I showed you previously, and these are the thoughts actually that I gathered on the slides from the conversations I'm having in the recent couple of weeks with people around me. Well, this concern about your life, about your health, about your relationship with important people, uh, concerns about access to being in touch with people who are important to you. This means only that all of these things are very much valued by you personally. It means that you care about them. So if you detect a fear of losing something or a fear of being at risk, instead of focusing on the fear, focus on how can you protect that. So for example, ways of protecting those valuable things uh, include Staying at home, protecting yourself when you need to leave, protecting people also who are around you and when you are staying at home. This is also the way you prevent the spread of the virus. So also this is the way you care for, for people uh, who are close to you who might be at risk of um, being infected with that. Um, if you have a fear that, for example, your parents can get sick and you, can, you cannot visit them right now because you are stuck in Poland, for example, and they are far away, uh, let's assume that kind of scenario, what can you do about that? You can ask yourself, okay, how can I protect what is so worthwhile, what is so valuable for me, my parents and their health? Well, what you can do, you can get in remote contact with them. You can talk with them about the situation at home, the place they are staying, whether they are protecting themselves. Uh, you can show them that you care, that you are there, that even if you are not physically there, that like emotionally you are still close. And also you can tell them that you need them, that they are needed, that they need to take care of themselves because you need them. Uh, you can get in touch also with uh, people from broader family, from your friends, if your parents need some kind of support um, uh, from the neighborhood, for example, so you can also get some kind of broader system around them, social system activated. But you yourself, you can also do something for them. You can still stay at home because the longer all of us stays at home, the sooner this all will be over and the sooner globally this all will be over. And this may seem like a very small piece of work, but it's like a butterfly effect. So when every single person uh, stays at home, it has individually an impact on the dynamics of the virus spread globally. And think about the fact that actually this whole situation must have started with the single, um, single infection. And where are we right now? We are in the moment when the world almost stopped. So also taking the small part individually is how we are helping to kind of reverse this process. Uh, Viktor Frankl, already mentioned by me, also said that Forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing, your freedom to choose how you will respond to this situation. So actually, this response is in your hands, in our hands individually. So how to respond um, to this challenge uh, we are all uh, faced with and to also psychologically survive in this situation. Uh, it may not be easy, but basically by trying to make it meaningful every single thing that you do every single day. How to make it happen? What you can actually try doing if you are not doing this yet? I will give you some tips and you can consider how it is in your experience. Is it helpful or have you tried that or not? Well, first of all, 
daily routine and structure is pretty much important because a lot of people right now uh, react with a lot of anxiety and lowered mood just because of the fact that this daily routine and structure was kind of broken. Um, even if you are having your classes from home, even if you are working from home, if you are the lucky one that has a job that you can still provide while working from home, it's still a kind of different situation. It's not the same structure, it's not the same daily routine. So what can you do to bring a little bit of this non-structure and routine back? First of all, sleep at night and be active during the day. One of the most common mistakes people do is that they uh, start to uh, sleep uh, during the day, they do not uh, go to sleep at regular hours. Uh, for the physical functioning of the body, but it also reflects our emotions in the long run, uh, it's not good at all because then you feel uh, some kind of confused, chaotic. Uh, also, even if you are sitting at home, dress up, do your hair, uh, do the kinds of stuff you would normally do if you were supposed to go out somewhere. So, do not walk in your pajamas all day long, even though it may seem kind of, hmm, I can do it right now, like normally I, I couldn't. But on the other hand, it makes you feel as if you are not uh, in the position to be active, to be engaged in something, and so also to be engaged in something to be meaningful. So keep similar times also of your meals and of your activities, and if you have any kind of regularly repeated activities, make sure you have a time for them every day. Keep in touch with your family and friends. This is very important. So even though you cannot meet them, so you cannot visit your friends right now, even those friends who are, um, you know, who are in, in Warsaw or in Poland, basically, or in the, in the city that you are right now, um, uh, maybe even a friend who lives like two blocks away, well, now it's better to contact using um, Skype, using Google Meets, using other uh, software um, online, but not in, uh, in, pre in person, because that would be putting at risk not only yourself, but also people around you. But try to keep those connections as much as you can using um, the remote connections. Also, keep yourself busy. Um, uh, this is very important. So try to look for some kind of activities that you still can be engaged with. So if your university offers online classes, and uh, most of the um, universities in Poland switch to online um, uh, teaching, and uh, be there for every class you can attend. Maybe there are some additional trainings offered online. Uh, whatever you can do to keep yourself busy, to keep yourself engaged, keep doing this. Uh, you can start also preparing for your final exams. Think about this, that because we will have final exams at the universities, we are not going to um, wait for them for the coronavirus to be over. We are trying to keep things um, uh, as much uh, within the routine and the structure as we can. Uh, so we can start learning right now. We can start reading um, the assigned readings, preparing some kind of project, uh, because maybe this is also kind of opportunity for you to use this time that you have additionally received from, from the universe, let's call it, or the fate of the coronavirus, uh, that you could be preparing yourself and studying more. Why not? Um, also, you can join open access online trainings. A lot of platforms offer that. Um, and basically prepare for the time that the isolation is over. Maybe you wanted to learn foreign language, so we can do it today. Uh, there are a lot of um, online access trainings and uh, mobile apps, and also there are people who give um, online conversations. So you might be doing a lot of things that maybe you didn't have enough time in the past. Uh, also, keep your mind and your body in a good shape. Because when we are staying at home, uh, sometimes we forget that we are not having enough um, physical activities as we used to when we are just going out and coming back, even if we are just traveling for classes or for work. But right now when you are at home, this is the only area of your physical exercise. But what can you do? 
for sure you can if healthy you can drink a lot of water uh, you can use materials online materials for mindfulness for breathing exercises relaxation um, and uh, you can also join some uh, online classes or use mobile apps for some physical training uh, like some yoga or plants or Zumba if you have bigger room in your apartment or learning new dance choreography whatever you like but keep yourself moving basically um, I try also to include those uh, even small activities even like 15 minutes of activities daily this could work a miracle uh, but keep it in your daily routine because this will also give you the sense of a structure um, and this will also prepare yourself for the time the isolation is over when you are supposed to go outside and meet with other people um, also, how you can uh, support your emotional well-being while well, joining social groups for people who are in a similar situation that you are. This is very helpful. So you are not the only one who's challenged right now. There are a lot of people actually worldwide um, who are stuck at home. Uh, a lot of them cannot go back to their countries of origin at the moment because of the travel restrictions and also financial issues, many different reasons. So you can share how you feel with other people. You can find out how they are doing. You can share what was helpful for you. You can also find out what was helpful for them. Uh, if it's not enough, you can also search for professional support. A lot of psychotherapists provide online consultations at the moment. So this might be also an option for you if you need it. Another thing that I would really recommend you is to find something some kind of area of your um, experience or expertise to, that can make yourself useful so what is it that you know that you can teach others that you can share with others maybe you can give online language lessons maybe you can um, teach other people how to play the guitar how to sue anything because imagine right now a lot of people of staying at home and uh, a lot of them especially young people um, they are challenged with a lot of boredom so also being helpful for others this is also helping them to survive during those difficult times but also a very good way of making yourself helpful and useful in this particular situation is staying at home itself uh, we can discuss whether this is an easy or a difficult way of making yourself useful because I know that for some people it is easy, some people even feel fine staying at home and doing everything remotely. But I know that for a lot of us this is a challenge because you may feel isolated, you may feel trapped somehow. But there is this paradox that staying at home, this is not doing nothing actually by staying at home this is how you respond to this challenge of coronavirus because this is how you put a piece some kind of effort your contribution to the fact that less people will get infected with the virus this is very important and the more of us stays at home less people get infected uh, this is actually the way we are saving lives of each other at the moment uh, though I know that this is like a prevention procedure, so you never know what the situation would be if you wouldn't do it. But um, the more of us stays at home, the better the outcome is going to be. And actually, the epidemic situation will be over sooner. And it will be over one day, and this is for sure that it will be over one day. And then when the situation is over, uh, and uh, if you think about the moment that we are in right now and you look back at the moment um, that is happening today, you can be in the position of asking yourself, what did I learn about myself when it all happened? What kind of experience it has been for me? How did I respond to that challenge in my life? And actually, right now we are working on the answer to that question so you decide how you are going to respond whether you are going to be involved as a part of the community and society worldwide to help also other people stop spreading this and get back the world to normal because in a way you have your part in making the earth spin 
again. And this, th these are the ideas that I wanted to share with you. And of course, um, more information you will find on, um, on the Facebook groups and um, website of, of, the, of the program um, uh, Go Study Poland. Um, but right now um, we can uh, we can switch to questions. Um, I've seen that some of you uh, already asked some questions. So let me scroll to, to the beginning of the questions because they appears already during the talk. Mm -hmm. First question. Okay, thank you very much for this question. Speaking of online classes, how can we deal with the lack of motivation? Yeah, this is very important because with the motivation, it works like this, that if you let yourself a little bit uh, lose your motivation, it might be more difficult for you to get back to um, uh, to being motivated and to being involved in studying. Uh, most of all, I would say that uh, do not skip the classes. This is the first thing. Take part in everything that is offered, any kind of activity. Um, and just let yourself be in this. I know that for a lot of you, it's not an easy thing to be in online learning as you are used to person-to-person -person teaching. Um, so uh, just let yourself experience this. Do not expect too much from yourself from the beginning. Do not expect that you are going to just jump into the, the course or, or the lecture. Um, but do as, do as much as you can, as much as you feel at the moment that you can. Also, do not burden yourself with too much at the same time um, and keep keep the structure also keep the structure you can uh, think about the structure of for example um, uh, reading one of the assigned readings uh, after each lecture uh, and keep doing this regularly um, Okay, um, another comment about uh, Pomodoro technique to make you feel more motivated. I'm not familiar with that technique, um, or maybe I am, but the, the name is uh, something different that I know. Um, something to make, make you focus. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see from the description you put here, Pomodoros is a technique to help you focus. You have to work completely focused during 25 minutes. The rest five minutes, just stretch a bit, stand up, drink water, and go back again for another 25 minutes. Well, yes, this is a good advice because, uh, first of all, our mind works in a way that we cannot focus for a long time constantly. So when you feel that you are losing your focus, that you are losing your motivation, it's better to do something else. That's why do not put a lot of pressure on yourself. So walk around, stretch a bit, drink water. Drinking water is good at any point. So do something else, and then it will be easier for you to get back again uh, with some kind of clear mind. Um, this is a very good. Um, okay. Uh, another question. I'm not going to die. Uh, I'm not going to die or have none of my family or friends, but I'm worried about my university professor. Maybe they could die because of this coronavirus pandemic. Mm, so we can close your university for at least two, three years. Oh, okay. So this is the concern that you would have to um, have a gap in your studies. Um, well, um, Let's put it this way. When you think about the probability of uh, having so many professors at the university being affected with the coronavirus that they wouldn't be able to work, whether because of uh, dying or being very, very sick, how likely that is that it will happen to all of them at the same time? How likely that is that the whole university society um, will be affected with this? Well, of course, there is a risk that some of the academic society um, will be affected and directly um, uh, may become even a victim of the situation as we all are at risk. But the, the risk of closing university for a couple of years 
uh, this is kind of unlikely scenario. So we can test that about um, about the um, uh, the proofs about um, the data you have about that. Uh, to share with you the situation at our university, we close the university, the SMPS university I work at, uh, we were closed even before this um, uh, the restriction was uh, introduced by the government uh, and uh, there was no case um, of uh, any person uh, diagnosed um, at that moment. So hopefully we kind of took a step ahead and a lot of universities in Poland did the same. So um, actually universities are not the, the, the area that is mostly at risk, I would say that more in, in the medical uh, health professionals, there is this kind of issue. So we can keep testing this thought against reality. Hmm. Um, okay, do we have any other questions? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, uh, this comment, thanks for the lecture and the various pieces of advice. Don't you think the situation is getting out of hand and people are really losing hope? Uh, well, it is a situation that brings a lot of uh, fears and also it activates in people some anxieties that we, we have in our history, in our past. Well, every person is vulnerable and every person is uh, is, is mortal. So, uh, of course, it activates uh, death anxiety, anxiety of losing close people around you. And this is a, definitely a normal reaction to the situation. But when you think about losing hope, you can try to think from the perspective of what is the possible course of action in this situation and what it has been in the past. Because thinking about us staying at home and trying to live our lives from home, hoping that the situation will be over in, in some uh, weeks or months, uh, we don't know exactly how long. The good thing is that um, you have a shelter. Uh, we, are, uh, we are lucky ones because there's no war around us. There are people in different places around the world that are more at risk of dying because of um, other causes. So actually just being isolated, staying at home, but having uh, some, um, some things to do, you can still attend your classes, you can still contact with your friends. Well, it's not the worst case scenario. And uh, when you take a look at uh, epidemiology data, uh, well, we are waiting for the moment when it's going to be in the um, in the highest level of this uh, normal distribution when you remember this. So then we would expect this to drop down. So we don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but you can keep observing the data. I know that for a lot of people, it brings some kind of relief. Uh, is there any organizations to share with some ideas to prevent the spreading of the virus? Um, but is it about uh, your ideas to share how to stop uh, spread the virus or some tips for, for you to uh, stop uh, spreading it? Because uh, when you take a look at WHO organization, they have a very specific part on their website that is devoted only to coronavirus situation. And they have daily situational reports. They have recommendations for uh, health medical professionals and for uh, for public in general. So you can take a look at both. Um, I, I, I would take a look there. And the second very good source of information is uh, John Hopkins University website. They have um, the, the active in real time map with uh, incidents of coronavirus that have been detected um, uh, globally. So you can get a lot of data and recommendations there. And also Johns Hopkins University is, uh, is the leading medical university in the United States also when it comes to, to research. And also they, they're in the process of a lot of um, uh, research trials in terms of working on, um, on uh, vaccination and, um, and medication here. So I will take a look there. Uh, next question, how do we deal with the bells who always put us under pressure and always putting the timeline without any consideration of our condition? 
yes this is this is difficult well uh, I can tell you uh, one thing because the situation is uh, putting a lot of pressure on a lot of people and um, I guess you are describing the situation in which the person who is supposed to organize your work and provide you with good conditions to uh, to keep working um, despite the situation um, is no helpful but is uh, giving you more burdens. Uh, this is a situation that we come across when we have um, a boss who is not dealing with the situation uh, personally, probably. So it's, this person is putting a lot of pressure on people who are uh, the employees. Um, it's, it's difficult because I know that you are also dependent like financially um, on the relationship with that person. But um, what I can suggest is... Um, you, you, you can try uh, providing this kind of feedback um, of, of sharing uh, how helpful or how not helpful that is for you performing your work. So um, if, uh, if your boss is giving you some kind of new tasks, but in a way that um, they are not introduced in a helpful way to, to fulfill them, uh, you can comment on that, so saying, you know, uh, I'd love to keep doing this, I'd love to be useful and um, um, engage in the work, but if you put it like this, it's not helping me to work, it will be easier for me, uh, I would be a better um, uh, uh, a better um, uh, worker here if I if I uh, do it differently. So so try to reflect this. How does it influence your work personally? Um, next question. Uh, how to how oh, sorry so many questions. Okay, how can we help medical staff in a voluntary action to face this global pandemic? Uh, how can we help medical staff? Well, um, I don't know if you are uh, tracking down uh, the way people are trying to help at this moment. Many, many people. Uh, in Poland, for example, we have um, uh, we have some kind of actions that people who who, have, who can sue their they're doing masks. Uh, they're suing masks. Uh, there are people who have access to 3D printers, they're printing also some uh, medical equipment for medical stuff. Um, but actually, when you listen to a lot of paramedics, medical doctors, nurses, there is a big social campaign. What they are saying, they're saying, you want to help us? You stay at home, because the more, more of you stays at home, the faster we can get back to our families as well, because they're also dealing with a lot of isolation at the moment. So when you are thinking about doing something that really matters, then, well, if you are staying at home, you are already doing this. So that might be it. Um, how to persuade grandparents to stay at home if they don't take the situation seriously? Okay, um, I had the same issue with, with my grandparents personally. Well, what, what can you do with, with people who are older? Because you can discuss different, different risks. Well, one risk is that they are in a vulnerable population. So they are at risk of developing um, consequences and uh, lung failure and to die because of coronavirus if they get infected. So there is one group of people, um, older people, who are aware of that risk and they have very strong needs to keep their life protected and health protected and for them this is like the enough reason to stay at home but for a lot of people who are older it's not enough reason to stay at home because they keep thinking that they want to be in control they want to do something they want to be um, active and what, what I found out that for the second kind of people, um, a good reason to stay at home is actually that when they are staying at home, they are protecting others. So your grandparents who are staying at home, they are also protecting your parents, they are protecting you, they are protecting your siblings. So if they don't want to stay at home because of themselves, and because they care of themselves, they can stay at home because they care about you. Um, so you can try to reverse this into this perspective. Um, hopefully, it works. 
it will work. So next one, um, hello, thing for lecture. I had a rumor from people that this semester universities and school will not open. Can you please make sure is it right information? Okay, I can tell you from the perspective of the university I work at, um, I've never heard about that. In fact, we are starting uh, the admissions process next week. So we are not in the position of preparing to shut down. We are in the position position to preparing to welcome new students, new year students uh, in, in October. So definitely not. Uh, it must be a rumor. I, I, I would be I would be really um, um, really careful about that because there is there is no no reason to to believe that. So it, it, it might be just some kind of rumor. Um, I meant here in Poland to share some practical solutions to be as a volunteer. Okay, to be as a volunteer. Uh, well, I don't know if among you are any uh, med school students, but I know that for med school students there might be some opportunities to get involved as volunteers. Um, however, it uh, it might be um, uh, it might be dependable on the place you are living and your university. Um, but also remember that uh, one of the important things for you right now is also to keep uh, yourself uh, active as a student, also to not put yourself at risk. Um, I don't know if you are speaking Polish because this might be kind of difficulty every year for you. But what can you do? How can you make yourself useful? You can uh, join some kind of groups online, also for people who are foreigners uh, in Poland, um, to join with them, to meet online, to to discuss, support uh, each other. This is very important. There are a lot of people who feel lost and confused in this situation. Um, so, so I would rather suggest this kind of stay at home, but be helpful, supportive um, activities. If you can give, for example, um, lessons, conversations to, to students in Poland, because uh, our all schools are right now moved uh, to online uh, teaching, um, so uh, children at schools, they don't have uh, so many um, lessons of uh, foreign languages as they used to have uh, because of the situation. So it might be very helpful for them to get in touch with them, uh, to give some kind of uh, advertisement of, um, on some, um, in some places online that you can um, provide this kind of expertise. Um, uh, maybe th this could work. Um, okay, next one. I do agree with your comment, Martha. There are so many people around the globe who has no or limited access to basic sanitary items like soap and water for shelter. Unfortunately, yes. The world is so advanced that we can still participate in online classes, have access to food and other basic necessary things essential for life. Hope this situation will get be, will get um, better soon. Exactly. And you know, this is this is the thing that um, actually worked with my grandparents that I them you know you survived second world war you survived holocaust and right now there is no direct and uh, immediate threat to your life or health because the threat is not immediate there is a risk but not immediate threat and when you think about this from this perspective the situation is not as bad as it might have been and also thinking about people who are in different places different countries when they are not having enough um, access to san sanitary um, uh, equipment, this is a completely different situation. How can we deal with uh, dormitory colleagues who seem to be careless in time like this? For example, in some dormitory, I heard they got out without reason, probably because they are bored. These are like threats to others. Well, yes, these are threats to others. Uh, what you can do, well, I believe a lot in uh, colleague to colleague um, uh, support system and interaction. So th the first uh, thing I would suggest that you try to talk with them and uh, to share with them that, well, everyone is, is getting bored at some point um, and uh, that maybe you could uh, think of doing some things together. Well, if you are in dormitory together, um, in a way, you are also kind of privileged because you are not stuck in uh, in a studio apartment by yourself right now. So you you are in touch with other people also physically. 
so it's also a kind of uh, different situation so so maybe you can do something together without going outside you can tell them that you are worried about them that you are also worried about the, the whole uh dormitory um community because they're putting at risk uh, everyone because if anyone from the dormitory get um infected that you would be in the quarantine all of you so that is like a real threat in this situation. Hopefully right now with the restrictions, if they're going out without any particular reason, the, the authorities also are making sure that not too many people are on the streets right now. So um, uh, hopefully it's going to get better. Um, I heard that when people uh, cope with stress, they either take actions, talk about their emotions or ignore the problem. Uh, how can we help those who are in denial? Uh, yeah, what the what the denial the problem is that um, it's really difficult to um, to um, to to hope that the, the person will be reasonable because all the reason is hidden um, behind the denial. Um, remember that the denial is the defense mechanism, which means that the person who is, is in denial would be probably so scared and would feel so fragile at the moment that is using the denial not to feel uh, so miserable. So this person is probably really, really scared. So you can think about it when you're talking with that person. But what can you do? Actually, you can think about what might be um, some kind of motivation for, for the person to, to be more uh, self-aware and, and caring for, for staying at home and not putting oneself at risk, whether this could be own health or someone else's health or um, some financial fines uh, that are also introduced right now by authorities because different motivation um, is seen in different people. Uh, oh, someone is recommending to make a donation if you want to be helpful. Yes, thank you for, for sharing this. Uh, yeah, uh, in a lot of places you can make that happen. Uh, there are um, uh, NGOs in Poland that are collecting money. Also, WHO um, has launched a fund that is um, gathering uh, money to fight coronavirus globally. So you can also make a donation globally to that WHO fund. Um, so yes, this is a very, a very good advice. Thank you. Uh, my mother says, it is worse than war because coronavirus, the enemy, is hidden. Um, well, it is hidden and it's not hidden in a way that we know that it is a virus. So we know something. It's not that we, we don't know a thing. We know something. We know how it spreads. We know what kind of uh, behavior is dangerous. We know how to prevent ourselves and people around us from getting infected. Um, actually, if you stay at home and you keep yourself safe, the, the risk of being infected uh, are not so uh, high when it comes to dying or becoming a victim uh, when you are in a war zone. It's a completely different situation. Also, this threat is not like a direct threat right now. And uh, it's a probability. It's, uh, also, when you take a look at statistics, how likely it is to, to develop um, uh, fatal consequences of the coronavirus is not that huge risk as if the risk of dying um, in, a, in the war zones that are currently even happening uh, in the world, in, in different places in the world. So it is hidden, but we know what that is on the other hand. We don't know uh, all about that, but, uh, but at least we know something. In a way, we are also more, uh, well, in lots of ways, we are more equipped than we've been with the previous pandemics. Um, because this is also the first time in the human history when we are all observing and watching spread in the real time. So the figures, the data, uh, we had access to it um, at the time when it was happening. So we are also equipped with information, um, with um, uh, medical experience of fighting other diseases that were contagious and also diseases uh, that, um, that are no longer with us because we, we, we prevented them so um, so greatly. Uh, so, so we are not um, uh, lost without uh, resources. You have resources and it's also good to remind yourself what you have, like what kind of resources you have to use because it's, it's not that you cannot do anything about it. There are some things that we can be doing and 
these things, even though they seem really little and small, they are very important. They may work like this butterfly effect. So if you stay at home, if you protect yourself, if you keep other people protected around you, you increase chances of being sooner in the face when this is all over. And I hope we'll all get there soon enough. So I guess we are reaching the, the end of the meeting. So uh, keep looking at, uh, at the Facebook and the websites of, uh, of the, of the um, Study Go Poland. Uh, oh, we have one more. We're talking about dying at the beginning. That's why I put the question closed in university. Oh, okay. Okay, yes. Yes, hopefully we'll all survive in, in one piece and we'll get better. We'll get back to you to studying, we to teaching. And well, actually, we are doing it right now. Like you have online classes, we have uh, online teaching. So we try to keep things as normal as we can, though it is extraordinary. Okay, guys, take care, stay safe, stay at home, support one another, and uh, keep looking at, um, at the fan page of Ready Study Go Poland and, and Facebook fan page as well. Take care, guys.